Yeah. Okay. So let me get started. So my name is Eric Gordon. Um, I am a professor at, uh, at Emerson College, uh, where I direct the engagement lab and also a research affiliate at MIT. Oh, and there's Tomas. Uh, wonderful. Um, hey, Tomas, I was just getting started and uh, I am sharing my screen. So, uh, so we will get started. Uh, so that's me. And let me hand it over to my uh, co-author and presenter, Tomas. Hi folks, how's it going? Uh, as Eric said, I'm Tomas Warna. I'm, I'm a research affiliate at, at, at MIT and I'm a, I'm a PhD student at Stanford. Um, Eric, would you mind kicking us off? I'm having some trouble with my notes. Absolutely not. So, all right. So, um, so let's let's get started. So, as I mentioned, this is uh, we're, we're gonna we're here to talk about trust um, and governance, um, and we're really interested in the work that 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 um, we started doing together is to really understand what the role of of kind of technology solutions is among government organizations as they are thinking about um, problems of of trust or mistrust. And so we set out to do, uh, we, we started this research about, about a year ago and, um, and we'll, we're gonna tell you about our sort of high level findings. Um, we'll sort of uh, provide some, some examples and then I'm hoping we'll have some time for some conversation um, at the end, um, at, at the end. So, so let me get us started. Public institutions are experiencing considerable mistrust. Uh, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't think that anyone in this room um, would, would disagree with this sort of general premise uh, that, that trust in institutions is a sort of challenging topic at the moment. Um, globally with the rise of fascism and isolationism around the world, uh, we've seen an amplified fear of institutional corruption. Um, this is exemplified by you know, um, election denying in the United States as well as, uh, as well as other things around the world, but coupled this with a deep suspicion of other cultures and people. Public institutions are struggling to respond effectively to this to this context, and you know often they are seen as too slow, um, too general to meet specific needs, and and consequently uh, they are seen as inauthentic, inauthentically representing the public. So Edelman's uh, 2022 trust barometer, which is a survey that measures trust in institutions in a set of countries shows that trust fell slightly worldwide um, in 2022, but this fall, this fall of trust was much more pronounced in democratic countries. So for example, trust in government in the Netherlands fell by 11 points and 12 points in Germany. So we wondered how are municipalities diagnosing the problem of trust and what technologies are they using to solve it? So to, to answer this, we carried out 30 semi-structured interviews with technologists and the leaders in Argentina, Spain, and the US. And the outcome of this research in this report uh, are in this report we just published within our foundation. And you can download it using this, this QR code over here. So uh, we were gonna share afterwards. So, um, so we, we learned this mostly leaders acknowledge that they have a trust problem, but they tend to diagnose trust in two different ways. So, for some leaders, the lack of trust stems from the perception that the government does not share values with the constituents. So these mean, meant that the government could not connect with citizens meaningfully and therefore have trouble pro providing public services. And for others, lack of trust is due to the perception that the government is incapable of facilitating reliable transactions. And this means that the government is seen as too inefficient or too slow compared to the efficiency and the speed that the media ecosystem has gotten people used to. Um, and we saw the government programs designed to address, address this trust deficit, however it is diagnosed, exists between a spectrum between two approaches. So on one end, cities are investing in bolstering the trustworthiness of the institution um, itself. So this is done through communicating the benevolence and the capability of the government by investing in programs where people have positive experiences with government agencies or government actors. Government actors. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum, uh, we see that cities are investing in proxy relationships where a human or a machine functions as an intermediary between the institution and the constituent. So when repairing links of trust with a particular constituency is perceived to be too costly, institutions are incorporating intermediaries to help facilitate the relationship between the institution and the constituent. 
So throughout our research, we identified that cities employed numerous technologies that combine these two strategies. So we're not gonna talk about them all, but if you're interested, please check out the report. And then again, we'll share that link at the end of, of our presentation. So, but we're gonna focus on three technologies that we see as emblematic of how these trust building efforts um, you know, get, get constructed. And again, we're focusing on the trust by proxy modality, right? So we, we've, we've just identified that that, that cities are sort of operating in one of two ways. They're, they're, they're either investing in the institutional trustworthiness, and this we see in the sort of traditional public engagement paradigm, or investing in the kind of proxy relationships, which we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna talk about here. So one example is uh, social media influencers. So in the last couple of years, uh, public institutions have, have grown their reliance on them to advance messages and connect to hard to reach constituents through the relatableness and the connection to their audiences that influencers have. So for example, uh, this is a screenshot of a post made by Loon. Loon is a YouTube and Instagram content creator and podcaster. And he was hired for, uh, by Guilford County um, to participate in a, in a vaccination program in an effort to get the word out about vaccination um, back in back uh, last year. So Loon described how he created his own concept for the piece by sticking a vaccine card on his forehead um, and doing other kinds of, um, you know, sort of silly tactics or fun tactics that he felt represented him. And so this kind of personalization is precisely what makes this tactic effective. So social media influencers are an example of this trust by proxy. So since Guilford County was having a hard time reaching some constituencies, um, and encouraging them, encouraging them to get vaccinated, they decided to depend on Loon to intervene in this relationship. So the thing is, is that influencers, uh, while effective, right? Uh, this is the, the idea of a kind of trusted, um, trusted messenger, um, you know, get somebody to, uh, to, to say the thing that you wanna say, and that, that's more convincing than the kind of institutional language that we're used to, um, but, you know, to, to do this on a kind of institutional scale requires uh, significant coordination. So of course, Loon didn't do this alone or influencers don't act alone in most cases. Technology companies have actually been created um, to support the relationship between influencers and institutions. So Zomad is, is a good example of this. So this is a, an analytics company um, that, and it's a platform that organizes nano and micro influencers. And so a nano influencer is anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 followers. A micro influencer is anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 followers. And so they organize these nano and micro influencers into specific campaigns and use, and they use them or rather they use an algorithm to determine the reach of each influencer. So if they're really looking to reach say, you know, Latina mothers um, in their 30s, then they have the analytics, they have the data to determine this influencer is going to be reaching that many people. So we're going to use this influencer, or this group of influencers to reach that demographic. So it's very precise um, in the way that it, that it gets used by, or the way that Zomad is able to sort of, um, uh, to create this kind of targeted messaging campaign. Um, so you know, so the, they, they, they use these analytics, this algorithm to determine the reach of each influencer. And this is including the given audience's demographics and geography. And then they facilitate paying each influencer for their individual posts. So Zomad carefully measures the impact of their campaigns and then, you know, um, and illustrates this back to the, to the um, you know, to the client. In this case, it's the company, I'm sorry, the, the government. Um, and uh, and then is able to sort of visualize it as we see here in this in this chart that's that's represented on screen. I should also say that Zomad as a company, um, you know, works primarily with brands like Clorox um, and other major major brands. And only recently, actually, in the last couple of years, have they started working with governments. So uh, so there's some interesting kind of tensions um, that are emerging there. Um, and there are really interesting implications with this rise of influencers. So Andy Lutsky, who's the executive vice president of brand partnerships at Zomad argues that, that these campaigns work best when influencers have autonomy. 
Um, so this can this can complicate the institutional relationship, though. Uh, so once once governments authorize an influencer to speak on their behalf, they become partially liable for the possible actions that the influencer can take. So uh, we're seeing a new sort of trusted messenger emerge in this relationship, and we'll we'll talk more about this um, in a bit. But now I'm going to hand it over to Tomas. Sure. So another example of trustway proxy can be seen in blockchains and. Blockchain is a decentralized ledger technology, mostly used in the context of transactions of digital assets like cryptocurrency. Um, cities like Reno and Nevada are incorporating blockchain technologies to redirect trust to the code itself and facilitate more reliable transactions. And influencers were an example of human proxies, or institutions depending on people and their relations to connect with citizens. But blockchains are an example of a machine proxy, where institutions are not relying on people's trust in the, in the government, but on the trusted deposit in the code of the blockchain. And a central theme in the existing literature and public se sector uses of blockchain is its ability to increase or facilitate trust in government processes through the immutability of records and the redundant data verification processes. And as such, the technology is often represented as trustless because it bypasses the need for human actors to trust a mediating entity. So Teddy, a blockchain developer in Nevada, explained to us, the whole point is that it's supposed to be trustless. It, it's supposed to be a trustless system where you don't need to trust anybody to follow through with your side of the deal because it's automatically going to be executed by a trust by a smart contract. You don't need to trust anybody. So blockchain technologies are being used to create the idea of an immediately responsive uh, trustless system that creates confidence in transactions. And this is exemplified in Quark ID, a project started by the city of Buenos Aires in collaboration with blockchain startups and nonprofits with the idea of creating a digital identity system. And this system could, in the government's eyes, materialize the vision of an interconnected government that at the same time offers guarantees that privacy and autonomy are prioritized. However, technology can be used to both redirect trust to the technology itself and at the same time retain some of the human values that create trust. So smart assistants are a clear example of this. Uh, the image here belongs to Boti, which is a kind of digital, digital concierge for the city of Buenos Aires. As a digital representative of the city, it can handle a range of requests from where to get vaccinated to how to pay for pay and parking tickets. So the left uh, image here uh, is the avatar that the government uses, uses in all of its promotions of Boti. And the right image, uh, this is a conversation with, uh, with, between me and Boti, where Boti was telling me that my COVID test uh, returned positive. Um, so it was a very interesting conversation. Um, and in our interviews with the team behind Boti, we saw that they had a vision of the government as being both efficient and relatable. So Boti's team devotes significant resources to the, to the development of Boti's personality, making sure that they have a perfect balance of cleverness and utility. So Marisa Vereda, uh, Chief Data, Data Officer of Buenos Aires, refers to Boti as both the, cities, the city and the citizen meaning that it is not only designed as a proxy to the government, but rather a, an affable representative of the government that makes people feel good about their interactions. And according to Breda, once they were able to refine the personality of the bot, people stopped talking to the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of Security. They started talking with Boti. So we finish our report with some recommendations for policymakers. Uh, these, are, these are all included in the report uh, and we encourage you to look at them. Um, but we want to point out the first three as they're most relevant to the conversation today. So the first one is to connect interventions to diagnoses. Too often, smart governance interventions are imagined and executed without intentionally making the connection to what motivated them in the first place. Is distrust a matter of unreliable transactions or misalignment of values or both? So in, in any case, we need to make sure to talk about the nature of the problem that we're trying to solve before talking about how we're trying to solve it. So civic technology interventions will be more effective when they're part of a, a part of broader strategies to foster trust in institutions. So, you know, as uh, we, we've just shared with you three examples of, of, of sort of trust by proxy interventions um, that we're seeing in, in government. What's really interesting is that, um, you know, we started this presentation by talking about these kind of two different diagnoses, like this misalignment of values on one hand, 
people don't trust us because we don't represent them in their values. That's that's often how people understand the mistrust problem, or the the the, the inefficiency of transactions, which is, or or rather like lack of um, reliability of transactions. Um, so people don't trust us because um, because our interactions are, or our transactions are not um, reliable. So both of those things exist within practitioners' heads as solutions that need to be solved. Um, but what we're seeing is that the smart governance interventions don't necessarily align or the dots aren't connected in practice. And so the first recommendation we provide is um, making that connection more clear. The second recommendation is to think critically about proxies. Proxies can be a very effective way to address institutional distrust and get things done by including third parties in a trust relationship, as, we, as we've been talking about. But it is unclear what impact they have on long-term trustworthiness of the institution. So much more attention is needed in making the connection between the trust relationship developed with the proxy and the institution. So when I trust the influencer, what is my trust relationship with the institution? Does it actually does it actually connect? Does it extend to the institution? So institutional leaders should also assess the risks and implications of authorizing non-government voices as official ones. So non-human proxies like distributed trust blockchains should also be assessed critically. So when we put our trust in the technology that is can automatically function through smart contracts, uh, what are we doing to the institution, the, the, any kind of trust relationship that exists within the institution um, that presumably stands behind that smart contract. And then finally, to critically explore the use of AI in creating proximity. And so when we, when we talk about proximity, we're talking about that, that perception of, of um, the perception of trust. So being close either temporally or spatially to the institution. So empathy and relatability can be virtues for government institutions and their proxies. We know that and we, and, and we see this in all sorts of examples. So creating bots that feel almost human can cultivate trust among constituents like we, like we have seen with Bhatti. It also can generate skepticism if, if it becomes too human or inauthentically mechanical. So what level of relatability is too relatable? As cities invest in digital concierge or human proxies, there is need to understand what kind of relationship is optimal to achieve sustainable benefit for the institution. So the investment that the city of Buenos Aires puts in the, the development of blockchain, or I'm sorry, uh, the development of Bati's personality is specifically about making that machine relatable um, but at some point, does that machine appear inauthentic because it's trying to be more human um, than is comfortable? And so that's something that we need to consider as more and more of these interventions um, are used to cultivate trust um, among constituents. And with that, I want to uh, thank you um, and encourage you to, to download the report. And we have a longer webinar uh, scheduled for December 5th. Uh, where we'll be talking with some of the people that have been part of this research um, to explore in more depth um, these issues of trust um, and governance.